Hello and welcome to the first departmental seminar of the year. Um, we are really excited today to kick off this term's talks with a really excellent speaker and an excellent subject. So we have Lucy Crane with us today and Lucy is a senior geologist at Cornish Lithium. Cornish Lithium is a very exciting company doing really excellent work um, in Cornwall in a really exciting field. So we are very pleased that she has um, she has taken the time to come and talk to us about this. Lucy is heavily involved in the company's business development and expansion. She's a strong advocate for the standardisation of sustainable and responsible practices in mining, and she is a really, really good spokesperson for the value of resources and mining for resources for, for green technology. Uh, she's been on the committee for the Young Mining Professionals London since its inception, and she sits on the executive committee for Women in Mining UK. In 2009, she did a TEDx talk on mining our way to a low carbon future, and she has a degree in earth science from Oxford University and a master's in mining geology from Camborne School of Mines. Um, we are very excited about this talk on lithium and the energy at transition. Please do post your questions in the Q&A, which you will find in the Teams live event. And with that, I'll hand over to you, Lucy. Lucy, you're on mute. How about that? Can you hear me now? Perfect. Great. My mute button on my microphone stopped working. <laughs> so always helpful. Is that OK? Perfect. Wonderful. Right, I'll start again then. Thank you very much for having me here today. And thank you so much for such a lovely introduction as well. It's such a shame not to be actually seeing you in person. It's slightly surreal talking towards my laptop in my kitchen, but I think we're all probably getting used to it now. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about lithium and the role that it has to play in the energy transition. So I'm going to start my talk by setting a bit more of a general scene as to why mining is going to play such a pivotal role in this energy transition, why it's so important that we do it responsibly, and actually why lithium really is a key driver of this energy transition as well. And then I'm going to spend the second half of my talk, probably slightly more, talking about what we're actually doing down here in Cornwall. We're exploring for lithium, but we're exploring for it in a slightly from slightly unconventional deposits or deposits that five years ago were definitely considered unconventional. We're looking for it contained within geothermal waters and we're looking for it contained within mica minerals within the granite itself. So I'll go into more detail about that as we get further along. You're always very welcome to request the disclaimer from me afterwards, but we have to put it in all of our presentations. Um, so I wanted to start with this phrase and it's something that our lecturer put up right at the start of my master's. He put this on the board and it was the phrase that if something hasn't been grown, then it's been mined. And when I've been involved in schools outreach and things like that, it's something that really kind of surprises people. People don't realise quite how pivotal raw materials are to our daily lives. Everything that we use has been extracted from the ground in some way or another. So take a smartphone, for example. Your typical smartphone these days has two thirds of the elements from the periodic table within it, which have all been extracted from a whole variety of mines around the world. And they've all got different impacts associated with that extraction. So if just a smartphone has two thirds of the elements from the periodic table within it, think how big the impact is on our lives of the raw, ma raw materials that we're consuming every day. As we go through this energy transition, this means we need a whole new suite of technologies to enable this low carbon technologies such as wind turbines and solar panels and batteries to store this energy at a grid scale and batteries in electric cars to allow us to move away from cars that are driven by fossil fuels, for example. So this means that actually as technologies develop, we're using a different suite of metals than we have done in the past, we're using rare earth elements a lot more, we're using a lot more of the transition metals. And so this means that we can't simply recycle 
everything that's already in the kind of urban environment that's already in the urban mine rather raw material extraction is going to still play a really crucial role in what modern society looks like but also in what a society that's combating climate change is going to look like as well so there was a fantastic report that came out by the world bank last year i think it was in may um, it was called minerals from minerals for climate action and it talks about the mineral intensity of this clean energy transition so exactly what i've just been saying if we want to move away from our reliance from fossil fuels because we want to combat climate change and we want to stop global warming going up by more than two degrees celsius then actually this report sets out different scenarios and quite how mineral intensive it's going to be if we want to build these low carbon technologies in time to combat climate change so a typical three megawatt wind turbine, for example, apparently contains five tons of copper wiring, two tons of rare earth elements, 1200 tons of concrete, and I think it's over five tons of aluminium. That's really significant, and that's just one wind turbine. If you then take into account that we'll need to revamp all of our kind of energy infrastructure here in the UK to a certain extent, we need grid scale batteries to store this energy. We want to utilise floating offshore wind where wind turbines are much bigger than three megawatts in size. We want to have electric cars, um, then they're powered by lithium ion batteries. For example, oh, so uh, where am I going with this? A lithium ion battery is great if you want something to be portable and lightweight because lithium is the lightest weight metal that we know and it well that we know it is the lightest weight metal and it's also got a really high charge density so if you want a battery that's lightweight and portable then actually lithium's pretty good yes there are other technologies on the on the horizon which may you know usurp it in the future but for the time being lithium ion batteries are pretty much the one to go to if you want something to be lightweight and portable so your mobile phone, for example, has a lithium ion battery. Your laptop has a lithium ion battery. A Tesla also has a lithium ion battery, but that contains 10,000 more times lithium than the lithium ion battery in your mobile phone. So as we transition to electric cars in particular, rather than internal combustion engine cars, this is really causing a step change in the amount of lithium and the other constituent parts of it that we need. If you then take into account that in the mining industry, on average, I think it takes 10 years from finding a deposit to actually producing from it. And actually people are predicting that by 2030, we're going to have a mass, mass adoption of electric vehicles, partly driven by policy, partly driven by people wanting to do the right thing. Then actually the mining industry has a huge amount of work to do now to be finding these raw materials in time for that energy transition to actually happen. And then something else that is kind of come into light over the last 12 months is quite how reliant Europe and the UK are on international supplies of some of these raw materials. I say some of these raw materials, I mean all of these raw materials. Um, we have very little mining in, well, in the UK in particular for metal. We've obviously got um, the tungsten mine up at Drakelands, which is restarting again. And we've got people mining for gold up in Scotland. but really we are totally reliant on importing all of the raw materials that we use in our technologies and our daily lives it's pretty much the same story for europe as well part of this reason is that over the last few decades europe's much preferred to take a nimby not in my backyard attitude to mining mining's dirty it's polluting you know it's much better if that doesn't happen down the road from our house actually so in europe we really have been kind of exporting our mineral demands offshore we've been very happy to buy the products of mining we just have much preferred that it hasn't happened down the road from our house i think we're going to see a change in that now one because europe and the uk are realizing that we need to have secure supplies of these raw materials and actually at the moment so many of these supply chains are controlled by china and secondly you know if we're producing these low carbon technologies because we want to help combat climate change, we want to transition to a green, clean energy system, then if we're producing all of these things in a manner that has a really significant environmental impacts and carbon impacts, then that's really not good. In Europe and the UK, we have got high environmental standards. We have got high 
labor you know, high conditions of labor laws and things like that work as a paid fairly um, companies are held to account for how they're behaving and so maybe there is an increasing argument for producing things closer to home to high environmental and social standards localizing these supply chains for things such as electric cars because actually that's going to significantly in decrease not increase their carbon footprint as well and you know it gives us that security of supply to put in context quite how mineral intensive this energy transition is going to be, again, I refer you back to some more World Bank statistics. They've got this fantastic stat that in the last 5,000 years, humanity has produced about 550 million tonnes of copper. The World Bank estimate that we need that same amount of copper over the next 25 years, and that's purely for use in low carbon technologies. So if people say to you, surely we can just recycle what we've currently got in circulation, Absolutely not. That's not going to anywhere near meet the demand for some of these raw materials. The World Bank also estimate that there's going to be a 965% increase in lithium demand from 2017 by 2050. Coming back to that statistic that on average it can take 10 years from finding, finding a mineral deposit to actually producing from it commercially, that's actually not that long. That means that as an industry we need to not only be increasing production in mines that are already in existence, but we also need to be looking in places that might be further away. You know, it might be deeper, these deposits might now be deeper undercover, they might be in more remote locations. Perversely, some of these deposits might actually be closer to home, and we've ruled out looking at them in the past, in the near, in the near past, because this NIMBY attitude. We also need to look at what have previously been called unconventional deposits. So, Lithium, I'll talk about in a bit more detail, but what we're doing at Cornish Lithium is looking for lithium contained within geothermal waters and mica minerals within the granite. Typically, most people produce lithium from a mineral called spodumene or from salar brine deposits. And these form in different geological settings. So this is going to be the same, not just for lithium, but for all deposit types. Maybe we need to utilize and embrace new advances in mineral exploration techniques, and ways to extract these critical raw materials to actually unlock what have previously been considered unconventional mineral deposits. I've probably mentioned most of this already now, but why, why are we as Cornish Lithium so interested in lithium? And it is because of its role in lithium ion batteries. The demand for lithium is increasing so rapidly because of its use in electric vehicles. The first lithium ion battery was commercialized in 1991, I believe, 1991 or 1992. And it's really only in the last, well, probably 20 years that we've started to see lithium ion batteries being used in things. It's used in mobile phones, it's used in laptops, but it's really only in the last five years or so that electric cars are becoming more and more mainstream. And if we look at projections to the future, then electric vehicles are very likely to become more prevalent on the roads than your typical fossil fuel fueled car um, in the next decade. So this is being driven by policy in a lot of places. So in the UK, we pledge that all new vehicles have to be electric by 2030. So there will still be older ones that are being phased out. But if you want to buy a new car, it's going to be electric. Um, the Norwegians are actually aiming to have all electric vehicles on the road by 2025. And actually, I think this year, in the last year, they actually sold more electric cars than traditional combustion engine cars. They re really are kind of pioneering ahead. The other thing to consider is that here in the UK, the car manufacturing industry is so important to our economy. If we think that all of these car manufacturers are going to transition to producing electric vehicles, then if we, you know, because the car industry is so important to the economy, the government is very keen for the car industry to continue to be important to the economy, which means that the car industry needs to start producing electric vehicles. If the car industry is going to be producing electric vehicles, we don't just want to be importing the lithium ion batteries that they're using. We want to have battery mega factories that are producing the batteries for these cars in the UK themselves. If we're having these battery mega factories, then surely having a localized supply of lithium and some of the other raw materials that are such key constituent parts of these batteries also makes sense. It's this whole ecosystem. If we want to capture that value in the UK and post Brexit, whatever you think of it, that is one thing that is um, also driving this. So I mentioned earlier that Europe currently produces no battery quality lithium. 
This is a map that's now well four years out of date. That's crazy. But I think it pretty much still holds true and it shows where the vast majority of the world's lithium is produced at the moment. You can see that about 45 percent, half the world's lithium is produced from hard rock in Australia. And this is mostly from that mineral that I mentioned, spodumene. The other half of the world's lithium comes from salar brine deposits in South America. So Chile, Argentina and Bolivia form what's known as the lithium triangle. In places that are really arid, such as the Atacama Desert, you get these salty brine deposits that form just beneath the surface. Or you, if you think of the Bolivian salt flats, most of us have probably seen pictures of that. What they do is they pump these salty waters up, up to the surface and they go into these huge evaporation ponds. I think I've got a photo of one later on and they just rely on solar evaporation. So it's a very cheap way of producing lithium. You're in an arid area anyway. You just rely on solar evaporation and over about 18 months or two years, the water evaporates off and you're left with this really, really, really salty fluid. That then goes into a processing plant and you'll produce something such as a lithium carbonate perhaps on site. In Australia, you'll be producing lithium from spodumene, so it's much more traditional mining. You will drill it, blast it, mine, mine it, crush it and extract your lithium minerals. What's really important to note about this is two things. One, China looks like it only produces less than 10% of the world's lithium from primary sources. However, what they've been very smart about over the last 10 years or so is actually developing the ability to refine what's produced, the mineral concentrates that are produced in South America or Australia. They're more often than not shipped over to China because the Chinese have got the ability to refine those into battery quality chemicals. So these are your 99.99% purity lithium chemicals that can then be made into batteries. So the Chinese are very good at capturing that value. What's also important about this map is the lack of any significant production from North America or from Africa, from the rest of Asia or from Europe. So that is changing. There is a lot of exploration happening around the world. Lithium isn't actually that rare, but finding it in places where it's kind of economically concentrated to make it viable to extract is a different story. And then this lithium chemical supply in 2018, you can see that China were producing over 50% of the world's lithium chemicals, yet producing 7% themselves. So that just shows quite how much material is being shipped from South America, from Australia to China to be refined into these battery quality chemicals. It means the Chinese also capture that part of the value chain. Um, and then it also means that your, your cathode manufacturers and then your battery cell manufacturers and the people who assemble these battery cells into battery packs, they're all much more likely to be located in that part of the world as well. So in Europe and North America, all of a sudden they're very keen to bring some of that process back closer to home because it means you just capture so much more value. Exploration. So that's all well and good. Why are we looking in Cornwall? So this map on the left hand side is from the US Geological Survey and in it they've highlighted hard rock lithium deposits and the red squares that you see are these LCT pegmatites, these lithium, cesium, tantalum pegmatites, and this is the kind of setting where you find spodumene. So you can see that there's a real cluster of them in West Australia, but actually they occur in lots of parts of Africa, in North America and Asia as well. They just haven't really been exploited yet. What might be harder to see is the yellow blobs. So we don't have these LCT pegmatites really in the southwest here. What we do have instead is a bulk lithium enriched granite that underlies the whole county. Um, this highlights five. I mean, there are more across the world, but in this certain USGS report, they highlighted five. Um, and you can see that there's this kind of Hercinium belt going through the middle of Europe. So there's one in the UK in Cornwall, there's one in France, there's one at the Czech border. And it's the difference is rather than these kind of narrow veined, really rich pegmatites, you've got a lower grade, but much more bulk lithium enriched granite. The granite is also important down here in Cornwall because it's hot. So on the right hand side, we can see a heat flow map from the BGS and it shows that there literally is a hot spot over here in the southwest. The granite is 
high, it contains a high amount of radiogenic elements and as they decay, it gives off heat. And that's why we've got so much more potential for geothermal energy down here in Cornwall than in other parts of the country. Obviously, we don't have volcanoes and the potential that Iceland has. Um, rather, it's a different type of geothermal energy that we'd be looking to exploit, one called an enhanced geothermal system. But I'll go into that in more detail in a moment. What does this granite look like? So it basically forms all of the topographic highs in the area. So if you can get your head in, this is Cornwall poking, poking out. Um, we've got Dartmoor in the east, so you can see Plymouth to the southwest of Dartmoor. And then all of the topographic highs in the southwest, if you've ever driven down the A30, it will, it will make total sense to you. Um, that's where the granite pokes out its surface. This granite was intruded between 290 and 270 million years ago. Um, and it's important for containing lithium, but it also drove a lot of the mineralization that Cornwall's best known for, perhaps it's tin and it's copper. The granite actually extends out to the Isles of Scilly in the west, so it really is a massive bulk of granite. There's a huge potential resource here, whether that's for heat or whether it's for lithium. So to put that into context, how significant is this lithium potential? And on this figure on the right hand side, this is from a paper produced by Gorserol, um in 2019. And um, hold on, I've just left. There we go. And it looks at metric tons of ore of European lithium deposits and compares them to the average grade, which is the weight percent lithium oxide. So what I've circled, and it's a log scale as well. So some of the famous European deposits are Yadda, which is the Rio Tinto deposit in Serbia um, that they're currently in the process of releasing feasibility studies for and looking to start to mine. That is a really big deposit and it's also pretty high grade. It's an anomaly in the world. There's one called Sinovec, which you might be able to see, which is about 14,000, or what would it be? Between, yeah, which is kind of on the bottom right. That's another quite famous European lithium deposit. And then there's also Zimwald. So you can see that they all are, some of them are decent sizes, but the one that really, really stands out is the St. Austral granite, and that's what I've circled in right in the red here. And you can see that it's an order of magnitude bigger in size than all of the other deposits that have been identified in Europe in this paper. The St. Austral granite is just one part of this Cornubian batholith that underlies Cornwall. And actually, it's more complicated than that. The bulk grade of the St. Austral granite says here is what 0.08%. The St. Austral granite itself, there's actually five different granite types which have been mapped within the St. Austral granite. Some of those are more enriched in lithium than the others. So it doesn't tell the whole story, but just to try and get across, there is significant potential here. Bizarrely though, lithium was actually first recognized in Cornwall within geothermal waters rather than within the granite itself. And these hot springs used to plague the deep mines. So Cornwall's got this amazing mining heritage. It's been, we've got evidence of mining going back here for over 5,000 years. We've got evidence of trade going on with Cornish copper and gold and bronze. If four and a half thousand years ago in the Nebra Sky Disc, and there's over 3,000 named mines here in Cornwall. And the vast majority of them are for tin and for copper. These mines are mining very steeply dipping, fairly narrow veins that they call mineral loads. And there are engine houses dotted around the county. And these are here because they're dewatering the mines. So what they do is the engine houses pump water out of the mines, which kind of artificially lower the water table, which means that you can mine to deeper and deeper levels. Some of the water that they are pumping out is meteoric water. So rainwater that's kind of fallen on the ground, trickled down and percolated down. But some of the water in Cornwall they're pumping out is what from what they used to call these hot springs. So whilst they were mining along, mining along a mineral load, they'd hit one of these, they're cut quite frequently by these perpendicular geological faults. These have different mineralization within them and they're often quite permeable as well. They called them cross courses because they cut across the course of the mineral load. At these intersecting structures, you'd quite often get upflowing hot water and these hot springs could be a real welfare issue. You'd have water flowing at 45, 50 degrees Celsius 
at depth in the mine, it could be 100% humidity. So it can actually make working conditions pretty unbearable. And there are some mines in central Cornwall where people could only work for 15 minutes at the lowest levels, and then they'd have to rotate out because it was so hot and miserable. It's these hot springs that contain lithium. And so the first experiment that was done to test the geochemistry of these hot springs was in 1864. And Professor Miller from King's College in London came down to Cornwall, filled up some sample bottles of these hot springs, took it back to the lab and ended up writing a paper which basically says, you can probably see on the diagram here, the temperature of the deep levels in this mine is remarkable. These are in, um, so a fathom is 1.8 metres and that's in Fahrenheit rather than degrees C, so the water is about 45 degrees C. But it also says the hot water issuing in great quantities at these depths is rich in lithia. And in his paper, he basically says these hot springs could be a potential source of lithium if only we had a use for it. So fast forward 150 years and here we are. We're actually looking for lithium within two different settings, as I said. So within the lithium enriched geothermal waters, but then also we're looking at potential to extract lithium from the granite itself. And that's where it's contained within mica minerals. These lithium enriched geothermal waters circulate within these fault structures. So these permeable geological faults are so key to our exploration program. And this diagram on the right tries to show that. The mineral loads occur in geological faults. They're very structurally controlled and these are cut by other faults. Some of the mineral loads are actually quite permeable. Some of the other faults are not permeable. It varies. So an important part of the work that we're doing is working out exactly how these fracture networks interact, which ones are more permeable than others, what depths are they more permeable. Um, but anyway, the idea is that these geological, these geological, these geothermal waters circulate within permeable geological faults. What we want to do is drill from the surface to where we know that there are geothermal waters circulating at depth. So I'm not explaining this very well at all. In this image on the right hand side, you can see that the black lines are old mine workings and we've tried to illustrate it. So these old mine workings are mining tin and copper that are contained within these steeply dipping load structures. These steeply dipping load structures are actually quite permeable. So some of the water that's entering these load structures is meteoric water that's trickling down through the soil and going into the structures like that. But some of the water that you can intercept in these load structures is actually these geothermal waters that are upwelling from depth. So these deep old stored ground waters that have been circulating in a hot granite, leaching the lithium, we believe, out of the granite and into solution. So what we want to do is not interact with old mine workings because there's a lot of there's a lot of crap in there that we don't want. Rather, we want to drill into these steeply dipping geological features below where they've been historically mined to tap into these deeper, you know, deeper circulating groundwaters where there's been a lot less mixing with meteoric stuff and pump those back to the surface. So hopefully that makes sense. And I mentioned that faults really are key to mineral deposits in Cornwall, whether that's tin and copper, whether you're looking for somewhere to intersect these lithium enriched geothermal waters that are circulating naturally. And this map on the left just shows quite how many faults there are cutting across Cornwall. You can see that in green, we've got these kind of east west trending faults. That's the typical trend of the tin and copper mineral loads. And then these red faults are the typical trend of what we call these cross course faults. You might get some kind of silver lead zinc mineralization in those, but these tend to be the more permeable later stage significant faults where you get these high permeabilities. And that's where there's a lot of potential for producing lithium from geothermal waters. And you can see that actually some of these faults extend offshore as well. And there's a fantastic database of bathymetry data that's just freely available that's all around the Cornish coast. And in that you can really nicely see how massive some of these fault systems are. We can trace some fault systems onshore for 10 or 15 kilometres and then trace them offshore for the same amount in the bathymetry data. So some of these really are large faults. That's important too because the longer the strike of the fault, the deeper it is likely to permeate, which means it's a bigger host for these lithium enriched geothermal waters.
The other thing to note on here is the granite outcrops. So you can see, or you might be able to see, that we've classified them from G1 to G5. And this is following some work done by Beth Simons during her PhD at CSM. Um, she took a lot of samples of all the different granites in Cornwall and amongst other things, looked at their lithium content. And she found that the later G5 granites, these are more highly evolved and these are actually much more rich in lithium. To get your eye in, the central of the five granite outcrops that you can see there is the St. Austell granite. I'm going to talk more about that later. This is the one that in that Gorserol paper, that's the granite that they've chosen to map the volume of to represent Cornwall's lithium potential for hard rock. Looking here, you can see that actually the story is more complicated than that. It's not all one lithium grade at all. Actually, I think four of the five granite types are represented here. They've all got so different pockets are more enriched in lithium than others. And it's these G5 granite pockets. They're the ones where there is the most potential to extract lithium from the hard rock itself. And then just a final note on Cornwall, it's got this amazing mining heritage. It's very much part of the local identity down here as well. People are wholly, it just seems supportive of restarting mining down here, but it has to be environmentally responsible and companies, we're going to have to be so transparent and open about what we're doing. We want people to understand what we're doing and come along on the journey with us and hopefully benefit from it. It can't just happen and it's a very them and us attitude. Social license to operate is so important. So to kind of summarise, this terrible cartoon that I've done might put into context what we see as our kind of four main work streams, well, three and a bonus one. The company was founded to look at the potential for producing lithium from shallow geothermal waters. So this is drilling down to about a kilometre, intersecting waters of about 45 or 50 degrees C and extracting the lithium from them, hopefully utilising some of the heat that's contained within those waters to power that processing plant. But there might also be applications for horticulture, growing tomatoes in greenhouses, for example. There's also the potential to produce lithium and geothermal energy from these deeper geothermal waters. The United Downs Deep Geothermal Project is just down the road from us here and over the road from where we've started to drill for shallow lithium and geothermal waters. They drilled down to 5.2 kilometres back in 2019 and they've got temperatures of about 195 degrees C. So obviously the deeper you go, the hotter it gets. And what we're seeing actually is a really linear relationship between the deeper you go, the hotter it gets, the higher the total dissolved solids, the more stuff there is dissolved in the water and actually the more lithium there is too. But there's obviously a payoff between the deeper you go, it's so much more expensive to drill. However, with the temperatures that you get at five kilometres depth, you have the ability to produce electricity from geothermal energy at surface and then you still have a lot of residual heat afterwards and you have higher lithium grades. So I'll talk in that, about that in more detail in a moment. So we've kind of got two lithium and geothermal scenarios, shallow and deep. And we're now looking at the potential to produce lithium from these G5 lithium enriched granites as well. And then finally, a lot of the work that we're doing here is building a big kind of 3D digital model of the subsurface, of the geology, of the mineralization, of the structures, where the old mines were. And as part of that, it's very hard to not notice potential for shiny stuff, for tin, for copper, potentially for tungsten. So we're keeping an eye on that, but it's definitely not our core business. So what are we actually doing? I mentioned that Cornwall's got this amazing mining heritage, and that is so useful to our exploration program because what we actually have two digital archivists who work with us and we've got access to archives of data that some of them haven't seen the light of day for 200 years. And Neil and Chris will go in and they'll photograph some of these maps. So some of them are kind of hand painted on vellum and they're massive. Um, there's absolutely no way you can put them through the scanner and they're, they're works of art. So they go in and they kind of take photos of them, digitally stitch them together. And then our GIS team take over. So we've got this huge database, I think it says here over 50,000 images, it's more than that now, of old mine plans, old sections. And we're pulling all of that together digitally to build this big 3D, 3D model of the subsurface geology. That then allows us to kind of really accurately target where we want to drill without having to do too much on the ground exploration. It's, we're just making the use of all of this 
you know, data collection that's been done in the past. And the work we've done so far has actually verified quite how accurate this stuff is. So what's that look like in practice? We'll get Neil and Chris to digitally stitch photos together and create a digital version of a map. So the two maps that I've uploaded here, this is in the central part of Cornwall. One is done by a guy called Thomas, who looked at joining up these geological faults between different mining districts in 1819. And then a guy called Simons actually did the same in a subtly different area. So there's some overlap, there's some not in 1845. So this is why GIS is so powerful. You can bring these maps into GIS, you can geo-reference them so they're sitting virtually in the right place. And then we can see if these guys actually mapped the same faults in the same place, because if they did, doing that 30 years apart and in slightly different areas, then that gives us a lot more confidence that these structures are true. So we can trace over these structures, which you can see here, and actually we've built it up to the coast as well. And then if we remove those maps from the background, you can see that actually it looks like there's some pretty good correlation between the two maps. That gives us much more confidence that some of those structures are real. And again, we've got these north northeast trending northwest trending sorry cross course faults with the mineral loads trending roughly east west we can also do this in three dimensions and we use a software called leapfrog so this is a section a slice through a mine so you've got the surface across the top you've got steeply dipping mineral loads and then the kind of yellower blob is um, some elven dikes these are microgranite dikes which cut across cornwall we can even use all the annotations that people have written on there previously. So we can trace over these things. We can make sure that we've still got these annotations captured within, within the model. And a lot of these mine sections were done at 100 metre intervals throughout the mine, first in an XY direction and then perpendicular to that. And so that is a really powerful tool to allow us to build up. So if we can do a section, step back 100 metres, do another section, step back 100 metres, do another section, and then you can interpolate between them. You can see we can very rapidly build up this 3D model of where are the permeable faults, where are the mineral loads, what are they doing at depth? And it's a really powerful tool. In parallel to that, so that's all using historic data, but in a modern context, we've also been flying planes to capture hyperspectral data to allow us to do mineral mapping where there's actually rock exposed on the north coast of Cornwall. Um, we've been flying drones. So I mentioned that we're looking for these big northwest trending cross course faults. That's great, but the centre of Cornwall is actually covered by a lot of vegetation. So we can use historic maps and sections to build up our model of the subsurface, but sometimes you actually want to go and see the geology as well. And the north coast of Cornwall is one of the best places to do this. A lot of them outcrop on the north coast and you get these steeply dipping cliffs. It's not viable for us all to go down there all the time and spend lots of time doing structural mapping. So unfortunately, much as we would love to. So we've been using drones and you can do this really neat thing called structure from motion. So you can fly a drone. You can just do it with a camera phone as well. But a drone just gives you a much wider area. And you basically take hundreds of photos of a cliff face. It could be a car or whatever you wanted to do a 3D model of. So it takes 2D photos from lots of different places. And then this very clever software that you can get freely available, um, Structure from Motion, allows you to kind of digitally create this 3D model of this object you've been looking at from 2D photos. So it'll basically match up a pixel in that photo, with a pixel, that same pixel in a different photo taken from a slightly different angle. And it's really clever. And if you can really accurately geo-reference some points, so we took out Trimble and geo-reference some points with high precision, that means that you can bring these 3D digital models of the cliffs into software. And then you can actually map these faults. You can do your structural mapping from these digital models. So obviously it's not quite the same as being able to scramble all over the cliffs and take readings with your compass clino, but actually it's pretty neat. And it means that you can measure things that are much higher up in the cliffs that you wouldn't have been able to access. Somebody can go back to it three weeks later and be like, oh, I'll just have a look at that. And then we're using this information to help us better understand what the kind of structural landscape is around here. And we want to start to build up a resource. How on earth do you model a resource for lithium enriched geothermal waters that's contained within fractures? Well, actually, 
you need to understand what these fractures are doing. You need to map these fractures and build up discrete fracture network models to understand the contribution of faults that are trending in a certain direction and dipping in a certain direction versus the little damage zone around them, for example. And then we've got hyperspectral information. Again, not much exposure in the centre of Cornwall. So if you can look at the wave cut platforms, for example, this might be somewhere that you can map mineral alteration. And what we were trying to do here was to see if there's kind of any characteristic mineral alteration that's associated with these big cross course faults. These big cross course faults that we know have, per have been permeable, there's been lots of fluids circulating within them. So actually, does that kind of cause any key clay alteration that we can use to vector in on which faults might be more permeable than others? So that's been using all of this information to lead us to places to actually drill and see if what we think is there is there. Over last winter, all of our drilling programs are in the winter. It's madness in Cornwall. Um, over last winter, we drilled two boreholes at United Downs, one to 800 metres, one to 1,100 metres deep. And the plan was to drill from surface into a number of these permeable geological horizons. And we sampled water from each of those permeable geological holes, geological horizons. Um, we've sent them away for assay. The waters were about 45 or 50 degrees Celsius, and they've come back with what we're calling encouraging lithium grades. So we're talking to a number of providers who can extract lithium directly from geothermal waters, and they're all really excited about the grades that we found. Unfortunately, we haven't published the shallow water grades, so I'm not allowed to say just what they are, but it's exciting enough to warrant us doing more drilling and more testing. We also have been collaborating with the United Downs Deep Geothermal Project. So this is literally over the road from where we've been drilling at United Downs. I mentioned that they've drilled down to 5.2 kilometres. They've got much hotter waters. And in the summer, they pumped some of these waters to the surface for the first time. And we literally collected samples in our thermos and sent them off to be tested. They've come back with really exciting results. They show that we've got average lithium concentrations of about 220 milligrams a litre lithium, 220 parts per million doesn't sound much, order of magnitude less than you have in salar brine deposits, for example, but actually relative to other geothermal lithium projects around the world, these are the highest published grades that we could find. And if I pop onto this next, oh yeah, and they're all stored on our site at the moment in these, these big cubic metre containers. So this is probably the summary graph about these deep geothermal waters that shows quite why we're so excited about it. So on the bottom, we've got TDS, the total dissolved solids. So how salty are the waters? And then on the Y axis, we've got the lithium grade. It, the X right at the bottom in the bottom left, the cross, the black cross, that's the typical comp composition of seawater. So you can see it's fairly salty, but hasn't really got much lithium in it. If we then look at this top right group that we've circled here, that's the typical grades that you can see within salar brines. So in places such as the lithium triangle in South America, we mentioned that you get these really salty lithium enriched brines. So they can have lithium grades an order of magnitude higher than the grades that we've got at United Downs project, which is this red blob. But actually, if you look at this graph, you can see that they are so significantly saltier as well. And that's really important. If you want to extract just the lithium compounds from a solution, then actually having a lot less other crap is, sorry, bad language. If you want to extract just the lithium compounds from the water, having a lot less other gump in it makes that a lot easier to selectively remove just the lithium. In the salar brines, for example, quite often you have very high lithium content, but you might also have very high magnesium content. And lithium and magnesium are similarly sized cations. So they both like to behave really similarly. So if you're trying to separate the two of them, then that's really quite difficult sometimes. What we're seeing in Cornwall, the geothermal waters down here, yes, okay, the lithium grades aren't as high as the salars, but we can have an order of magnitude less magnesium than we do in those brines. So they should be, and from conversations we've had with these direct lithium extraction providers, a lot more amenable to processing. It should make it a lot easier to selectively remove just the lithium compounds from the water with the chemistry that we've got down here. So we're now collaborating with the United Downs Deep Geothermal Project, which is very exciting. 
they are in the process of doing some final test work and building their power plant because they're going to be generating zero carbon electricity down here. We are collaborating with them to also build a pilot lithium extraction plant on their site. So the hot waters will be pumped up to the surface, flashed off, geothermal power will be created and then the water before it's re-injected back down to depth will go into a little pilot lithium extraction plant where we'll trial some of this direct lithium extraction technology to see if we can selectively remove just the lithium compounds from the water before those waters are re-injected. So that's actually kicked off on the 1st of January so it's very exciting. And then we're looking for hard rock lithium as well. So the St Austell area that I pointed out before this is in central Cornwall and parts of the granite here, pockets of the granite are this G5 granite. They're more enriched in lithium than the others. And the lithium is contained within mica minerals. So it's the polylithionite series. So we have zimaldite, lipidolite, and this is different to how most lithium is produced from hard rock at the moment. I mentioned spodumene. We don't really have any spodumene, Dan. In, well, we don't have any spodumene in Cornwall, really. There's some up in Scotland, but that's about it for the UK. There's some in actual Ireland as well. We are looking at producing lithium from the mica minerals because A, that's what we've got down here, but B, new technology has been, or technologies advancing, that looks like it should be viable to actually extract the lithium from these mica minerals. To extract lithium from spodumene, and I mean, Catherine knows much more about all of this mineral processing stuff than I do, you generally have to heat it to a really high temperature, be a thousand degrees C, because you need to crack the crystal structure to allow you to then leach the lithium out. To heat things up to nearly a thousand degrees Celsius, you need to use fossil fuels. So there's quite a significant carbon impact associated with that. What we're looking at doing is just using a hydrometallurgical process. So we don't actually have to heat up the mica minerals before we can extract the lithium from them. And we're collaborating with a company called Lipidico, who developed this low carbon way of producing lithium from mica minerals. We did our first drilling in the start of 2020. Uh, we finished literally two days before the first lockdown and we drilled 41 shallow holes. These were only 40 meters deep and we took samples of the granite rock. And we're actually hoping to start drilling our phase two drilling um, this quarter in St. Austell again. Um, however, Covid and Brexit might be delaying that slightly, but fingers crossed we should be able to get on with it fairly soon. What's exciting about this project? So the key selling points about the lithium and geothermal are it's really low impact. You just have boreholes tapping into waters that are circulating naturally at depth. You pump them up to the top, you utilise some of the heat energy, you selectively remove just the lithium compounds and then you can put the spent water back down into the circulating system via a borehole. It's very low impact and there's the opportunity for it to be net zero carbon as well if you're using that geothermal energy to power your lithium processing plant. A hard rock lithium project, that's a bit different, but it's as green and environmentally responsible as it possibly could be because we're actually looking to produce lithium from an existing China clay pit. If you, if you know Cornwall, um, the St Austell area is famous for producing kaolin for China clay. And if you ever go and look at it on Google Earth, it looks like moon craters. It really does. There's, a, there's been a China clay industry down here for at least 250 years. That's kind of in decline now because people aren't using paper as much. If we can use some of these existing China clay pits, repurpose them and produce lithium from the mica minerals, then that's really neat. What's also exciting is that actually as you produce kaolin, you're washing, you're washing the clay minerals out of the granite. You actually concentrate up the lithium rich mica minerals. So there's also the potential to produce lithium from waste streams that have been produced and piled up over the last 250 years. So it's in existing open pits anyway. There's the opportunity to reprocess waste and produce something useful from it. And then Finally, there's a lot of existing infrastructure there for mining that's currently underutilized. So if we can extract the material in that way and then use this low carbon manner to produce lithium from the mica minerals, then it is actually a lot more environmentally responsible than it might sound at first. Oh, and then just just finally, because I'm aware of time, um, I mentioned that Salar Brine's use of evaporation ponds, and this is a picture that just blew my mind when I first saw it, because apparently 
It's five kilometres from the front of this first pond to the one that you can see in the distance. So these are huge. They're expensive to set up because you've got to line them all with impermeable linings, but then it's very cheap. It just relies on solar evaporation. I think over 80% of the water that's pumped up to the surface is lost to the atmosphere through evaporation, which gives you this very salty solution left. And then that's what they extract their lithium compounds from. In arid areas, losing over 80% of the water from the water table to the atmosphere isn't ideal. And actually, it's causing a lot of environmental and social issues as well now. So although it's a cheap and on paper sounds like, you know, it's just using solar evaporation, nothing's black and white. If we can extract lithium from geothermal waters, then actually that's really neat. And it is, it really is the development of this direct lithium extraction technology that's being such a game changer. Finally, I mentioned again that there's an opportunity for it to be net zero carbon and there's a lot of research being done at the moment. There's a group called Vulcan Energy out in Germany who are worth looking up and they're doing fantastic things and making great strides towards actually producing lithium from an existing geothermal power plant there. But if we're producing these raw materials because we want to produce low carbon technologies, then we need to start thinking about what is the carbon impact of producing them this way? What is the water impact of producing them this way? What's the impact on the local communities? And that's why I think what we're doing down here in Cornwall is so exciting. We're using new technology as much as possible to incorporate historic data with satellite imagery, with data we've collected ourselves from drones and things like that, combining that to help us try and efficiently target where we want to drill. And then we're utilising new extraction technologies to try and unlock these deposits. So I think that's probably me done now. Thank you very much for listening. And um, yeah, if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Lucy. That was really, really a fascinating talk. Um, we do have time for questions. If you do have any questions, just pop them into the Q&A bar on the right hand side of your screen. Um, Lucy, we had a question from John Morley um, who asked, would lithium be extracted from the geothermal fluids using the same processes as at other geothermal deposits? And would this processing be done in the UK? Good question. So I mentioned that we're looking at this suite of technologies called direct lithium extraction technologies, DLE. And actually, if I go back one here and there's a range of ways actually that these DLE technologies work. Some people have developed very highly selective membranes that either collect just the lithium compounds or let everything else pass through. Um, some people use iron exchange resins. Some people are using, you know, there's a whole suite of different technologies out there and all of these providers that I've mentioned on the screen here have developed subtly different ways of doing it. We are currently in discussions with lots of these people and we're working out which technology would be most suited to extracting lithium from the Cornish geothermal waters, because the chemistry that we've got down here is different to the chemistry of the projects that they've got in in Germany is very different to the Salton Sea. It's not nearly as salty. Um, and so it may well be that the technology that's suitable here might not be the optimum one that they're using in California, for example. So we are very much intending to do this on site um, here in the UK. And actually, we're intending to produce a battery quality lithium product from our sites as well. So we want to capture as much of that value as we can close to home. I guess with the volume of water that you have to process, then you can only ever do it on site, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, yes, we're saying that the grades that we have down here are high for lithium enriched geothermal waters globally, 200 parts per million. However, it's only 200 parts per million. Um, we're looking at ways of concentrating that up before it then goes into the selective removal process. So that could be using reverse osmosis. We've been speaking to some very smart people who can do things with heat exchange. Um, so, yeah, but with the key thing is we're not using evaporation. A, it, it normally rains far too much in Cornwall for evaporation ponds to ever be a viable option. But B, you know, there's new technology out there that can do this so much more efficiently and environmentally responsibly. So that's what we want to use. Yes, and that would definitely be the um, the uh, the best route forward. And linked to that, Matt Jackson asked, asks what is the risk that cold lithium stripped water injected into the geothermal reservoir short circuits via fractures or other high permeability features and rapidly reaches the production well replacing the hot lithium rich groundwater that you need 
It's a good question and something that we're thinking about a lot. Um, we're working with SRK on our shallow geothermal systems, but we're also working really closely with the deep geothermal project. And the thing that seems to be key at the moment is that actually if you've got colder water being injected into a system, then that's actually significantly more dense than the warm waters that are rising. So the analogy that somebody used to me is that it's almost like dropping a penny into a slot machine. Um, that cold water will be so much denser, it kind of moves down and rapidly goes to depth in the system. And they actually think that that could be quite a useful phenomenon because if that's kind of shooting down, then you're kind of drawing in more warm water to fill that space behind it. But we'll uh, see, we're doing research on that at the moment. That's um, that's really interesting. JP actually has a, has a, a question about the depletion of lithium. He says, once you've tapped into the, um, the brines, is there any research that confirms that lithium concentrations would remain at those highly viable levels or could depletion become an issue? It's such a good question. And again, one that we are doing a lot of work on. Um, so I've kind of got two answers. So we're, we're, we're doing some research, um, which basically is looking at what is the recharge rate. So taking lumps of granite, putting them in warm water at pressure and seeing how long it takes for those waters to become enriched in lithium. But um, we're really not, we're not relying on that recharge. What is the most interesting to us? So I mentioned right at the start that it's a different type of geothermal setting to places such as Iceland. In Iceland, they've got really hot rocks really close to the surface. They're on the margins of volcanoes. They don't have to drill down far to heat up their water to produce geothermal energy. What we're doing here is using these big permeable geological faults where which cut into the granite and we know that at depth these groundwaters are being heated up becoming enriched in lithium and circulating within these big permeable geological faults so what we want to do is tap into those existing waters in those existing permeable structures and pump them up to the top so that's what's called an enhanced geothermal system it's one that's kind of naturally been enhanced already it's using these big permeable faults there are similar EGS, Enhanced Geothermal System, geothermal projects in parts of Europe, such as on the Rhine Graben and so Salts, and there's a place called Insheim. And from speaking to the technical teams there, they've done a lot of work on tracing how long it takes for new water, or you know, how long it takes for water that's already passed through their processing plant, their power plant, to come back into the system. And Typically, they actually use lithium as a tracer test, which is why we haven't done it down here. But what they find is that I think over 80 percent of the water that's coming into the plant is new water that hasn't passed through it before. And I think it can take on average about five years for that other water to circulate around and come back. So they seem to be really big plumbing systems and evidence that we've got of these hot springs that historically occurred all across Cornwall seems to support that. Some of these hot springs that they'd intercept would flow at continuous rates flow rates of 30 litres a second, continuous temperatures of 35, 40 degrees Celsius and continuous chemistries for the 30 years that that part of the mine was open for. So it seems to suggest it's quite a big plumbing system. But yeah, absolutely. How on earth do we model that? How can we rely on that? How do we know whether the recharge rate is important? There's yeah, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, yeah, it's exciting times um, for Cornish lithium indeed. I've got time for one. I'm going to sneak in one question. Oh, hang on, somebody else has a question. Um, a JP asked another question, actually. I'll, I'll ask his instead. Is the cost of drilling the main cost in exploitation? For deep geothermal, yes. So the reason that we've drilled down to one kilometre is that you can do that with a standard mineral exploration rig. We can use diamond core down to a kilometre fairly easily. and you know, it's, it's not cheap, but it is when you compare it to drilling down to five kilometres, because to drill down to five kilometres, you need oil and gas rigs. They are much bigger. And it's I think our drilling programme is on the order of magnitude of a couple of hundred thousand for the deep geothermal project. I think they spent about 14 million on drilling. So it really is a step change. So somewhere in the middle, there's going to be a sweet spot. I reckon it's probably going to be at about two kilometres, which you can, can probably still get down to with the mineral exploration rig. Temperatures will be higher. Your lithium grades will be higher, but it's so much cheaper. But can you generate electricity? That's the question. Great. Gosh, that is um, it's expensive to go to go deep. <laughs> that's, um, that's been really fascinating. We are out of time. 
Um, but I would just like to say thank you so much, Lucy. That was a really, really fascinating talk. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's it's been an excellent way to start the year um, and an excellent an excellent start to the term of seminar. So thank you so much for that talk. Um, I'm sure you all enjoyed that talk. Our next seminar is in two weeks time and that will be Sarah Gazda uh, from North Research. She will be looking, she will be talking about um, assessment of safe and sustainable large scale CO2 storage. So we look forward to seeing you all then. And thank you again for attending our seminar.